The Afterlife Experiment Written by C.K. Walker Narrated by Alicia Pavlis I've always felt a little lost in life, like I never received complete instructions on who I'm supposed to be. Everyone else around me seemed to know exactly who they were. Their lives would fly right by me. Their GPSs locked onto destinations while I just sat idling in the street. In high school, I never did any extracurricular activities because I couldn't figure out if I was a sports person or a music person. I was no different in college. I wandered through four different majors, unable to decide who I wanted to be. I just felt like a blank slate. And if I was a blank slate, Micah York was the starry night, authentic. Beautiful and perfect. He was my antithesis, which is what attracted me to him in the first place. At the same time, I resented him. He was born knowing exactly who he was and what he was about. Micah's self-confidence was an all but tangible element of him. I envy the degree of certainty with which he progressed through life. Micah and I first met in our freshman year of college. He was a neuroscience student, and I was majoring in history. We dated briefly our sophomore year, after I changed my major to computer sciences. We broke up the following year, just before I decided to pursue a psychology degree instead. In my senior year, shortly after my advisor informed me that I was too late to switch majors again, Micah came to me asking for a favor. Our final semester of college was quickly approaching and Micah had been applying to grad schools. He wanted to get his master's in neurobiology, and I helped him with the applications when I had time. At the time, Micah was under a lot of stress to nail his senior thesis. For this reason, I found it peculiar when he announced he was throwing a party in January. Micah was a meticulous student, and he didn't throw parties. Ever. In spite of my misgivings, my interest was piqued. When Micah offered me an invitation, I accepted. When I arrived at Micah's off-campus apartment the night of the event, I hesitated before getting out of the car. His apartment was dark and quiet. There was definitely no party. I couldn't help but wonder what he was up to. I picked up my phone to call him, ready to tell him I'd changed my mind, but curiosity suddenly got the better of me and I hung up. Micah's door was unlocked. I let myself in and, hearing voices coming from the living room, headed in that direction. When I arrived, I found four people waiting. I knew two of them. Micah was there, of course, as was his close friend, an organic chemistry major by the name of Sean Nichols. The other two were introduced to me as fellow med student Irina Bradley and as philosophy major Holly Bishop. Irina scooted over and made room for me on the couch. I took a seat and waited for Micah to begin whatever it was he had planned. A moment later, he rose and walked to the middle of the room. Thank you all for coming. I'm sure you're wondering why you're here. Clearly, this is no ordinary party. Micah's tone was somber. The truth is, I have something of vital importance to ask each of you. Micah paused, took a deep breath, and dropped his voice an octave. I have selected each of you to take part in the greatest experiment of not only your lives, but perhaps in human history. I am asking you to take part in my doctoral thesis. I rolled my eyes. The presentation was classic Micah. He was many things, pretentious, arrogant, and pompous, but no one in their right mind would call Michael York humble. And what exactly is your thesis? I asked nonchalantly, ignoring his melodramatic posturing. A conclusive essay detailing what happens after human death. Irina laughed. Sadly, I knew Micah well enough to know he was being serious. How do you intend to prove anything? 
I asked. What kind of experiments have you designed? Well, Bridget, he replied. I'm going to kill myself. The room fell quiet, and Micah, mistaking the shocked horror for odd silence, stood a little taller and smiled. <laughs> you can't be serious, I scoffed. Oh, I am. And it's completely reversible. I am going to be the first person in the world to prove or disprove the existence of an afterlife. We, Sean corrected him. Yes, Micah conceded. We. He continued, this paper is going to be our ticket into any university in the world. Wars have been waged for centuries over deities and religions, and we are going to prove what is scientifically correct beyond a shadow of a doubt. I sighed. <laughs> I had heard enough. You're an idiot, I quipped, and headed for the door. Irina took my lead and stood to take her leave as well. Micah beat both of us to the exit and begged us to reconsider. Bridget, wait, he pleaded. Please, hear me out before you walk away. I narrowed my eyes at him and shook my head. No, Micah, I said. I'm not interested in killing anyone, not even you. Holly, who had been silent until that moment, chimed in coolly. I'd like to hear how it works. Uh, well, Sean began. I designed the process. It begins with injections of a specialized combination of chemical agents. He registered the look of concern on our faces and sought to reassure us. Don't worry. It's been tested, and it's safe. Tested? Irina cried. On whom? On lo local wildlife. No human trials? I asked. Not yet, but it is safe, Sean said quickly. So then, Irina asked, how does it work? She took a step back toward the couch, intrigued. With a gesture, Micah signaled Sean to continue. I have developed both a poison and a biologic. I call them Romeo and Juliet. Juliet is a poison that kills the body. Romeo is a biological antidote that revives it. Subjects will lie in a state of clinical death for just 30 seconds. Micah cut in. No brain damage, no organ damage. Yes, it is perfectly safe. He will only be dead for a short time. Sean confirmed. So, flatliners. I glared at Micah. What? Sean asked. Flatliners, I repeated. It's a movie. The characters kill themselves and bring themselves back. As I recall, it didn't work out very well. Micah is obsessed with the film. So he already knows that. That's a Hollywood movie, Micah said dryly. This is legitimate science. No. You're Kiefer Sutherland. I pointed at him. He's Kevin Bacon. I pointed at Sean. And I'm Julia Roberts. That's absurd, Micah said hotly. You're not Julia Roberts, Bridget. She is. He pointed at Holly. Am I Oliver Platt, then? Irina asked. No one is Oliver Platt, Micah shouted. Well, if we get to choose, I'd, I'd rather be Oliver Platt than Kevin Bacon, Sean interrupted. You're Kevin Bacon, Micah spat. And you're Kiefer Sutherland! I yelled at him. This isn't Flatliners! <sighs> I sighed. I'm not going under. No, Bridget, you're not. Micah looked exasperated. Then why am I here? Micah ran a hand through his dark brown hair. I've been trying to get to that. Am I going under? Irina asked. 
No. Just me, Sean, and Holly. And you think she's going to agree to that? I asked, incredulous. Actually, Holly interrupted, raising from the couch. I already have. Why? I gaped at her. Because I want to know, need to know, why I'm here. Why any of us are here. I want to know what the soul is and, and where it goes. I want to hold the keys to human existence, love and suffering, life and death. I want to understand our purpose. Plus, I'm getting paid and it's perfect for my dissertation. That's another thing, Micah said quickly. Everyone will get paid. How much? Irina narrowed her eyes at him. Five hundred dollars each. I groaned. I was short on tuition for the semester by exactly that amount. Micah knew it and intended to take advantage of me. The Romeo and Juliet agents are safe. They've been tried and tested and they will work. Sean and I have rented a house on Emerald Street to conduct the experiment. All I need, all I'm asking, is for you to show up, Bridget. To show up next Saturday. And what about me? Asked Irina. Irina, I need you to administer the agents and monitor our vital signs. The process will take less than a minute, and afterwards, you and Bridget can both walk away with your $500 and a credit on my thesis. You've got no evidence to support your conclusions, I countered. What makes you so sure everything will go according to plan? The agent Sean developed will be available to anyone and everyone, and they can repeat my experiment at their own leisure. But I don't think that... Please, Bridget, just show up on Saturday. Every facet of Micah's experiment made me profoundly uncomfortable. But the way Micah looked at me, the tension in the room, the $500. Bridget, I'm not asking. Micah grabbed my hands and squeezed. I'm begging. I'll think about it, I said. Micah was cocky, but also undeniably brilliant in the top one percentile of his class, with several published papers to his name. I couldn't help but wonder, what if the experiment worked? What if he was right? What if he found what he was looking for? Stories of near-death experiences had been reported by people throughout the world for centuries. In his experiment, Micah intended to delve deeper than anyone before in a controlled environment, in a manner that could be duplicated. The implications were staggering. I arrived at the house on Emerald Street the following Saturday. Curiosity had gotten the best of me in spite of my many reservations. Micah had been expecting me and flashed a smile when he met me at the door. From there, he escorted me to an expansive, sparsely furnished living room. Aside from three cheap-looking twin beds, a few camcorders and some hospital equipment. The room was empty. Sean and Holly were already laying on two of the beds with nervous smiles in their faces and IVs in their arms. Irina appeared incredibly stressed as she bustled around checking equipment. Micah approached and handed me a heavy, expensive-looking camera. The cameras at the end of our beds are already recording. They're our static cameras. I need you to walk around and record with this one as well. Rena is going to stagger our injections so that she can handle all three of us. Your task is to film the experiment and nothing more. Okay, Micah, are you sure you want to do this? Bridget, we've tested this. And as long as Romeo is injected in under a minute, which it will be, there is no risk. There is definitely risk, Micah. Near-death experiences? This isn't a near-death experience, Bridget. It's a near-death experiment. Look, I know you're worried. And that's why I wanted you here. To make sure nothing goes wrong. Even if it does, 
I have volumes of documentation proving that it was my experiment. Yeah, but... I began to object, but stopped short. I realized I had nothing else to say. Micah would have an answer for any doubts I expressed. That's the way he was. There was no stopping him. I could either bear witness or be elsewhere and simply hear about it. I chose to stay. Micah walked over and stood in front of my camera. It's 12.51 p.m. on Saturday, January 14th. My name is Micah York, and this is the first attempt of the afterlife experiment. Micah walked over to his bed, sat down, and gave a nod to Irina. She found a vein and expertly inserted a needle. When she was finished, Micah reclined and addressed Sean and Holly. Remember to speak directly to your cameras immediately after you regain conscious in order to report your feelings. They both nodded. Okay, everyone, Irina said, failing to conceal her trepidation with mock bravado. Everything is ready. All right, Micah said with excitement. Thirty seconds. He turned to Irina. Once the last of the Juliet leaves the tube, you know what to do. Micah pointed to the digital timers at the head of each bed, each of them set to thirty seconds. Irina nodded. Bridget, are you ready? I nodded. See you on the other side, he told me with a smile. Micah gave Holly and Sean a thumbs up. They returned it and then settled back on their beds. I hit record. Irina picked up three red tubes from a nearby table. Steadying her hands, she quickly injected the first tube into Micah's IV. His heart rate monitor flatlined instantly. I flinched as the abrupt squeal caught me by surprise. While I attempted to steady the camera, Irina hit the timer above Micah's bed, hurriedly moved over to Sean and did the same for him, and then Holly. Irina put her hands over her ears in a futile bid to muffle the discordant shriek of the three EKG machines. Get this! She called to me. Bridget, record this! She pointed to Micah's EEG, which displayed zero active brainwaves. Get Holly and Sean's, too! I began to panic. The experiment was a bad idea, a very bad idea. I returned my gaze to Micah's timer, which had just eight seconds remaining on it. Arena had already prepared the green tube containing the Romeo Biologic and was on standby, ready to inject Micah with it. The cacophonous squeal of the EKG machines was deafening. Each high-pitched beep seemed to scream. Do something! Do it now! Why are you just standing there? Save them! Just when I thought I couldn't stand any more suspense, a different alarm buzzed. Arena wasted no time injecting Micah with the antidote. I waited with bated breath for Micah's vital monitors to show signs of life. Less than five seconds later, his EKG monitor registered one spike, and then another. Moments later, Micah's EEG machine flared to life as well. I exhaled. Irina stepped over to Sean to prepare the injection of his dose of Romeo. When Micah suddenly shot up in bed, eyes wide, and opened his mouth, I was so excited and curious that I, I almost forgot to hold the camera up. I couldn't wait to hear what he had to say. But Micah didn't say anything. He screamed. The suddenness and force of it, the most blood-curdling scream thing I had ever heard, caught me off guard and I, I, I stumbled backwards into a wall and, and dropped the camcorder. Then Sean started screaming. Micah ignored everyone else and flung himself out of his bed. Before Irina and I had any idea what was happening, he began smashing his head against the hardwood floor, connecting with the hard oak over and over again. Beside him, Sean jumped terror-stricken out of bed, knocking Irina out of the way in the process and ran to a nearby wall. He stopped an inch or two from it and shrieked in its direction. Not at the wall? but threw it, oblivious to his surroundings. What happened? I begged. What did you see? 
My shock gave way to hysteria as Micah quickly became less recognizable with every sickening crunch of his skull against the floorboards. By then I had long abandoned any efforts to document the calamity along with the camcorder. Arena, help me! I cried. Arena, who hadn't moved since Sean had knocked her out of the way, stared at me wide-eyed. We need to get him off the floor. He's hurting himself. She opened her palm and looked down at the one remaining tube of the Romeo Biologic as if she'd never seen it before. You didn't give that to her yet? I shrieked wildly. Give that to Holly now! I rushed to Micah and held him in my arms. All the while he continued to howl uncontrollably, smashing his head against a floor which was no longer there. The combined effect of he and Sean's ear-splitting, torturous screaming and the look of horror on Micah's face, his mouth forever open in a wide O, oh, nearly drove me to tears. Meanwhile, Irina, blinded by the tears streaming from her own eyes, frantically performed chest compressions on Holly. It was too late. Holly was lost. Irina! I called. Irina, call 911. She ignored me, or hadn't heard me, and continued working on Holly. I let go of Micah briefly to grab my phone. Before I could stop him, he took off, running toward the front door. M Micah, stop! I shouted. A moment later, he smashed head first into the glass. If Sean noticed the commotion, he didn't show it. He only screamed those piercing, horrible screams. Emergency services couldn't hear me on the phone, but they had someone at the house within five minutes. A very, very long five minutes. Irina gave up on Holly at some point and resigned herself to pacing around the room mumbling. I don't, I don't understand. I did it right. I don't understand. The first responders took Sean, Holly, and Micah away in an ambulance, and they took me and Irina to the police station. They watched the videos. I never graduated, but I managed to avoid jail time. Irina was not so fortunate. After her trial and conviction, I retreated into myself and refused to speak to anyone. I spent months holed up in my apartment, asking the same question over and over. What did they see? It's not as if I could ask them. Sean screamed until he lost the use of his voice permanently and was later admitted to a mental health facility, where he faces one of the walls in his room, with his mouth wide open, as if he was screaming. Somehow, it's worse than if he actually was screaming. Sean hasn't said or written a word since the day of the experiment. Mike has been institutionalized as well. Sometimes he screams, and sometimes he's quiet. Sometimes he thrashes, and sometimes he lies as still as the dead. I visited both he and Sean many times begging them to tell me what they saw. My efforts were fruitless until my most recent visit. When I last visited Micah, he was in one of his screaming phases. I sat with him and let him scream, waiting to see if he would transition to one of his catatonic stages so that I could speak. When I was tired of waiting, I leaned in close to his ear and asked him, Micah, what did you see? His screaming slowly morphed into an insane uncontrollable laughter, the likes of which I had never heard before. His doctor, who'd been just outside the room, came running in. What did you do? he asked, alarmed. I, I just asked him a question, I responded quietly. What was the question? I, I asked him what he saw. We both noticed the sudden silence at the same time. We slowly turned toward Micah to find him facing us, expressionless. It's all waiting for you, he said slowly. It's waiting for all of us. His mouth fell open into a large O, and the laughter slowly began again, followed by shrill, horrible screams. I immediately regretted my decision to visit and left the hospital in tears, wishing I'd never met Micah. As I drove home, however, I couldn't help but continue to wonder, what did they see? What's on the other side? Do I even want to know? But I... 
I suppose it really doesn't matter anymore. Someday I'll find out. And so will you. It's only a matter of time. Before the wait is over. Thanks for listening. The story you've just heard in this channel are fan-funded. Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com today to become a patron and help us bring radio theater back from the dead. Just click support us, choose an amount you're comfortable with, and become a part of our family today. Just $2 per month gets you immediate access to our patrons area. There, you'll find advanced new releases, our incredible archive of over 300 hours of productions, plus never-before-heard bonus material. Best of all, it's totally ad-free and in HD MP3 format. You get insider updates from our production team, the secret stash of streaming downloadable HD indie films, and you get to experience our patrons only one-on-one -on -one live events, putting you up close and personal with your favorite performers, unscripted and unrehearsed. All of this and more is yours today. And all you have to do is choose your level of support. Go to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com now and join us as we turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs>